This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, the thought and debate brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. And I'm your co-hostess, Dahlia Shenlin. Every week we'll be talking about books and research and other things that have caught our attention because they are fascinating. If you like what we do, please consider becoming a subscriber by giving to our Patreon campaign on the Tel Aviv Review website, All Amounts Help. Our guest today is Dr. Reza Aslan. He is a best-selling author and sometimes provocateur. He is an internationally renowned writer, commentator, professor, producer, and scholar of religions. His books include No God But God, which is about Islam, and the number one New York Times bestseller, Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth, among other books. He was host and executive producer of the CNN series Believers, among other shows. He holds a PhD in religious studies from UC Santa Barbara. And proper disclosure, we were both students together at Harvard Divinity School. Sorry, not together, but we were both students there and it was cool. Today we'll be discussing his latest book, God, A Human History. It was published by Random House in 2017 and we'll be asking basically why do humans need God so much? You are joining us on the line from California. Reza Aslan, thank you so much for being on the show. Hi guys, thanks for having me. <laughs> That's a cheerful start to a very heavy topic. And we want That's to start... <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's talk about God. Let's what talk about God. Wrong? Let's just, figure, let's just figure it all out right now. <laughs> How could anyone misconstrue us in this conversation? I don't understand how that could happen. <laughs> what could go wrong, so to speak? <laughs> Tell us, Reza, is the story of God a universal story? You look at many different you know, cultures, mostly Western cultures, over many different phases of human evolution. Does God mean the same thing to these different people at different times across history? Well, it's that's a really good question because this word God, which of you know all the words in certainly the English language is perhaps the most variable is also the one that we all just sort of assume we have some kind of universal definition for you know I, it always cracks me up when people say do you believe in God let's and, just crack up right know, now <laughs> yeah is that hilarious anyway <laughs> uh, I have a pretty lousy sense of humor, obviously. No, it's just, for me, the problem with that question is the proper response is, what do you mean by God? I mean, we all have a different definition for this word, and yet we all assume that the definition that we have is the definition that everybody else has. (laughs) And oftentimes when I talk, especially to, you know, self-described atheists who say they don't believe in God, you know, I'll often say, well, what do you mean by God? And then oftentimes what they'll describe is some kind of divine personality who very likely lives in heaven and who watches over us and perhaps controls our actions and maybe rewards us when we're good and punishes us when we're bad. And I say, well, I don't believe in that God either. (laughs) Even though once upon a time you did, um, because when you were a kid, you had sort of an image of God that looked a lot like your dad. Is that right? Yes. And here's the really fascinating thing that I learned in the writing of this book is that that impulse, the impulse to think of God in the way that I just described God, is actually, it, that's a universal impulse. It is something that we all are, in a way, born with, and it has to do with the very evolutionary process through which the concept of God arose in the first place. But, you know, we're not kids anymore, and we're not supposed to think about God or frankly, anything else in the world the way that we thought about it when we were children. And I guess what I'm trying to do, not just with this book, but with almost everything that I do, is to really challenge people to think differently, not just about their own beliefs, but about the idea of belief writ large. So what for you as a scholar of God who spent a long time writing a book about it, what is really an operational or functional definition of God? When you look at it, you know, in a, in a say, a, you know, a scientific, a detached sort of critical examination. I don't have one. Here's, this may not come as a surprise to you guys, but I work in a field, in a discipline that has literally no definition for religion. There is, in other words, no accepted definition for religion. We don't know what religion is. We don't know how to define it. 
Does it have to do with God? Well, no, obviously not. There are many, many religions in which there is no supreme being whatsoever. Okay, well, does it have to do with ritualistic behavior? Well, no, obviously not. There are uh, ritualistic behaviors in non, quote, sacred environments that mimic you know, religious rituals, but aren't. So it can't just be about ritual. If that's the case, then, you know, any kind of ritual action would be a religion. Okay, well, does it have to do with community and the building of a collective identity, uh, adherence to certain symbols that, that creates a shared sense of being? Well, no, not really, because, you know, you see that kinds of stuff in like, you know, sports events and, and concerts. So, we literally have no definition for my field of study. And except, so, except that we sort of know it when we see it. Sort of, sort of. I mean, here's the thing about religion and the word religion in general is that we're much more likely to apply it to ourselves and our religion than we are to other people's religions, right? It's why the word cult is no longer used in religious studies, because cult has become a meaningless term. It's basically just a value judgment. My religion is a religion, your religion is just a cult. a cult. Okay, let me ask you, let's, yeah. let's get a little bit theological here, because I think the main premise of your book is interesting to look at in contrast to Judaism. In Judaism, we have this notion that God made human beings, as we say in Hebrew, but selim enosh, in the image of God. Your book right. takes the opposite perspective, in a way. You chronicle how humans made God in their own image. Can you expand on this a little bit? And I think there's a lot to unpack in there, but why did they do that? There is a lot to unpack in there, and to put it in its simplest way, and by the way, this is the case. Most creation stories in the world, the vast majority of them, agree with the Hebrew scriptures that God made human beings in God's image, whether to serve them or to love him or as slaves or as equals with delight or with regret, accidentally or on purpose. The bottom mm -hmm. line is, is that God made us in God's image. And yeah, the thesis of my book is that no, actually human beings have made God in the human image. And indeed, if you take the entire history of religions going all the way back to the very origins of the religious experience, you can see that essentially one grand narrative about how humans have tried to understand God by increasingly humanizing God, by implanting in God human emotions, human motivations, human personalities, even a human body. Until, of course, you know, in the person of Jesus, God literally becomes a human being. Why do we do this? Well, it turns out that it's actually a cognitive impulse. It's embedded in our brains. It's part of the evolutionary process through which the very idea of God arose. Now, obviously, when we are having conversations about such things as the origins of religious experience and prehistoric religiosity, you know, we're delving very deep into the ancient past, and there's a lot of variables to consider. But I but like the way you sort you of put your mind inside the mind of the prehistoric man. I mean, you've got you've got yourself inside Adam's head in there. Yeah, <laughs> right. But that's well, that's what I'm trying to do here is say, all right, look, if we're going to say Adam and Eve were the first human beings, first Homo sapiens, let's treat them as though they're the first Homo sapiens. What, you know, what would their how would they eat? How would they live? What is their relationship like? And then most importantly, how would they understand faith? And we do have an enormous amount, by the way, of material evidence that helps us create a picture of what prehistoric spirituality would look like. And and fundamentally, the word that we use to describe it is this word animism. Animism, which is how scholars describe, again, prehistoric spirituality, is the belief that all things share a singular spiritual essence, that all things are animated, if you will, whether they're alive or not. And not just animated, but animated with a singular, and I'm just going to use the word soul, though of course it's an anachronistic word, but we all know what I mean by that. It's a that. decent I mean, symbol for understanding what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. And the question then becomes, how did this belief arise? Because Dahlia, you said something earlier on that's absolutely important. It is a universal belief. I want to emphasize this one more time. Belief in the soul is a belief 
that has arisen amongst all people in all parts of the world, in all cultures, and throughout all time without exception. So you're talking about even the cultures that are not covered in your book, well beyond the West, sort of Western world and Near East. Well beyond. Yes, it is a universal belief system. But is it identical, Reza? Believing in in the soul and believing in God, is it really two ways of saying the same thing? No, as a matter of fact, that's why I'm taking it back to, because this is before there was any such thing as God, before any idea as God. Even remotely recognizable as God. That's right. In fact, our first belief, the belief that ultimately leads to the belief in God is the belief in the soul. And that belief is pretty basic. It's the simple belief that says that we are more than our material bodies, that there is something immaterial and eternal about us, and that whatever that thing is, we share with all creation. That belief is not just universal, but here's the fascinating thing. We now have ample evidence from psychologists and cognitive scientists that that is a belief that we are born with. Children who have been studied, regardless of their culture or their nationality, regardless of whether they grew up in a religious household or not, have demonstrated innate, intuitive belief in what is often referred to as substance dualism, the belief that the body and mind, and you can replace the word mind with soul or spirit or essence or psyche or Buddha nature or, or chi, you know, whatever yeah. you want to call it, chi, whatever you want to call it, Brahman, whatever you want to call it, that those things are separate and distinct. We are born with that belief. It's not a learned belief. Is that the fundamental basis of your argument that actually the consciousness of our human souls was well predated the idea of God and that's why you say that it was humans that created? Because before we even start talking about whether humans created God in their image, we have to stop at the part that humans created God. That in itself (laughs) is a radical (laughs) argument, especially for somebody like you, who is religious on some level or has been at various times in life and maybe still is. I mean, isn't this a fundamentally secular pursuit to try to unpack that, you know, the idea that human beings created God to begin with? No, because the argument isn't that humans created God. That may be true. It may not be true. It's utterly unprovable either way. Okay. And so it's a question that I'm not really interested in. Mm -hmm. I personally believe in God. But that belief is not a rational belief, nor should it be a rational belief. It's an experiential belief. Faith is fundamentally an emotion. And like any emotion, it goes beyond sort of the faculties of our reason. It's about who you are as an individual, how you understand yourself in the world, how you recognize your relationships with other people, the experiences that you have. That's what defines whether you quote unquote believe or not. But what cannot be argued against is that the universal belief in what we're now referring to as the soul and the idea that it was the first belief. In fact, it's a belief that actually predates the existence of Homo sapiens as a species. We have ample material evidence to show the presence of such belief Certainly in Neanderthals, there's really no question that we can find it in Neanderthals. But there is, I think, an enormous amount of accumulated evidence to indicate the presence of the same kind of belief, even in Homo erectus. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years before our species even existed. And so this creates this evolutionary puzzle. Why? Why? (laughs) If this is a universal belief, then there must be a reason for it. There must be some kind of adaptive advantage for this kind of belief. Well, but in in some ways what you're saying, I'm just going back to the idea that you were saying it's not about sort of analyzing why humans created God, but in a way maybe we should say your book is about how humans came to understand God because you're not fundamentally saying that we created them. That would be too atheistic an approach. And also on this, Reza, if if I'd like to uh, can add to Daniel's question, To you, as a religious person, do you feel that your religious beliefs in any way facilitated your inquiry or hampered it or in any way intervened? Well, let's define terms. I'm not a religious person. I'm a person of faith. 
I have a fundamental belief that there is more beyond the material realm than that which we can understand with our empirical senses. I want to experience that thing. I want to commune with it because I truly believe that the human condition, when it's lived in its totality, requires that intuitive understanding, that knowledge, that belief that there is something other and that I am striving for that thing. Now, I need a way to express what is fundamentally an inexpressible experience. And that's when religion comes in. Religion is a language that we use to express this inexpressible experience of faith. And the language that you choose is irrelevant. It just, you know, it's right. a language that the metaphors and the symbols that, that are most comfortable to right. you. But to go back to this sort of original question and to just finish the thought for a moment. So if the belief in God begins first and foremost with the belief in the soul, a belief that we really have no explanation for. There is, we for 200 years have been trying to figure out why in the world this belief exists, what could possibly be the adaptive advantage to it. And the answer that we've come up with after two centuries of asking is that we don't know, that there seems to be absolutely no adaptive advantage to this belief. And so, it might very likely be just simply an accident, a byproduct of some other, you know, adaptive, evolutionary adaptive advantage that, that we required. But regardless, the belief in God begins first and foremost with the belief in the soul. And so, as I think Dahlia said very nicely, when we go to externalize this belief and to, to sort of envision it in the form of an other that we can commune with, because we're starting with ourselves, we are necessarily going to then construct a being who starts to look and act and think and feel just like we do. I think that makes sense. But I, I was very um, fascinated by the part of your book where you talk about the move away from the polytheistic and the pantheons and this sort of shift and it in fits and starts really towards monotheism. So I would love to go back yeah. and talk about some of that. Tell us why monotheism was so was such a total flat out failure in its first attempt in ancient it was, Egypt. It was yeah. so I was so interesting. I mean, we take it for granted now. So much of the Western world considers itself monotheistic, even though you raise some questions about that. But tell us about this total failure. Why was this such a hard transition? Yeah, it's really fascinating to think that in the hundreds of thousands of years of human spirituality, the idea that there is one sole singular God is barely 3,000 years old. And again, it's not, you brought up Egypt, but Egypt's not the only example. There have been many, many times in which the idea of monotheism has arisen in human history. It's just that every single time that it arose, it was rejected, sometimes violently so. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Number one, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> in, in the ancient mind doesn't understand why there would be one God for every phenomenon. Because there's so many things Remember, happening in the world. I mean, this is so counterintuitive to somebody, despite the fact that we live in a secular age, I have to admit that as a person completely born of the Western monotheistic world, it seems very intuitive. Why complicate the situation? Course, no. I, it's I, easier I, I, no, I when there's only the one. Other way around, but let Reza speak. Oh, yeah. Gil Gil uh, Gilad is <laughs> well, turning into a polytheist as we speak. Yeah. You're missing the, the <laughs> no, action I think here. Monotheism is counterintuitive more than polytheism. All right, so Go on, Reza. Sorry. Yeah. Well, to add a little bit to what Dahlia was saying is that it's what's fascinating is even traditionally polytheistic religions like Hinduism are becoming increasingly monotheistic because there is something about the modern world and the modern experience that is pushing us towards this monotheistic belief system. But again, let's think about it this way. If what we are doing essentially is ascribing to the gods our own attributes and emotions, what makes much more sense is a God for each one of those attributes and emotions, a God of love and a God of hate, a fatherly God and a motherly God, a God responsible for good and a God responsible for bad, a but God the most human for quality, the earth, a God for the sky. I still don't understand. The most human quality is that one single physical being like me or Gilad or you or Gizem here in the studio, we all of us can contain all of those emotions. So that's a very human quality to be able to contain love and anger and, you know, fatherliness or anything else. I mean, why 
did we have to create a whole separate God for each single emotion? I mean, Precisely. I'm not expecting you to really know that, but I just, you know, I think it's curious. No, no, I do. I, no, this is actually, so I, I address this in the book because while we are very comfortable about having all of those contradictory attributes and emotions exist in us as individuals, we are far less comfortable in that kind of contradiction in God. Okay. In other words, what we want, because first of all, it makes more sense, and second of all, it's more useful mm -hmm. to have an individual God for each of our individual needs. Whenever someone showed up and said, no, 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 there's just one God, there's no other gods, there's just one God, and that God contains within himself all of our attributes, all the contradictions that are involved in the human condition, the ancient mind just reflexively rejects that notion until it finally, finally works within Judaism. But I don't think people understand how long it actually took to work <laughs> within Judaism because... Yeah, and exactly here. I'd like yeah. to ask a question from my perspective, uh, the one opposed to Dahlia. So how do you account for this, the great success eventually of monotheism, uh, despite, or, or, you know, the fact that it's counterintuitive and all, all what you just said now, you know, it is at the end of the day, yeah. perhaps the, the most virtually, the most successful religious phenomenon in human history? Right. Well, there's a historical aspect to it, and then there's a psychological aspect to it. The historical aspect is very, very easy to trace. What we now refer to as monotheism, by which we mean the belief in one God and the rejection of the existence of all other gods, did not really exist really anywhere, let alone within Judaism, until after the Babylonian exile. So, uh, it's Im very important to understand that Abraham was not a monotheist. Abraham, whose God, whose personal God was El or Elohim, a Canaanite deity that we know very much, one of the most famous deities in the history of religion. Abraham believed that there were many gods. He completely accepted the existence of all these other gods, but he had one God that he himself worshipped. Same with Moses. Moses, whose God was not El, he had no idea who El was, he didn't know who Abraham was, he had no conception of Canaanite deities whatsoever. Moses was Egyptian, he lived in Egypt. His God, Yahweh, which is a God that is almost unheard of until he shows up you know, for Moses, is a completely different and separate God altogether. But Moses also was not a monotheist. He believed that there were many, many gods. It's just Yahweh was his god. And that's why Yahweh says to him, god, you will have no god. other gods. It's not so much that he you says, I'm the no only god, but you have no other gods. gods but yes. Me. Oh God, you are the highest god, the scriptures say all the time. That's a literal statement. It's not figurative. <laughs> you are at the very top of a gigantic pantheon of other gods. But here's the fascinating thing about this, is that that belief system lends itself to something that scholars refer to as divine warfare. You have to understand that war in the ancient world wasn't a battle between armies or tribes, it was a battle between gods. Gods were the ones who did the fighting. I mean, when you read the early chapters of the Hebrew scriptures, what you see over and over again is this framework of Israel's battles being battles in which God is the, bat is the person on the battlefield. God is the warrior. Over and over again, we hear how God is the one who killed most of the enemy. You know, in many cases, Israel's entire job is to just simply be still and know. That's it. Um, <laughs> so now we're getting into my realm. A, yeah. No, go on. And that's a belief that was widespread. So there's a consequence to that belief, which is that when one tribe defeated another tribe, that meant that that tribe's God defeated the other tribe's God. So, whenever Israel defeated the Philistines, it wasn't Israel defeating the Philistines, it was Yahweh El defeating Dagon. Now, well, this, is, this raises one happens? of the interesting points there. I, sorry to, to cut you up, but I want to just focus on this yeah. issue. You have a very interesting concept that you call, or you cite, I don't think it's your term, political morphism, did I say it right? Yeah. Which I think is mm -hmm. very interesting in the way you're showing us at this point the, the early stages of it. The battles are human battles, but they're being fought like political wars, but between gods. And then you'll later on argue that the structure of the deities actually start to reflect the structure of human governance. Can you talk about that a little That's bit? That's right. 
Yeah, so that's the second half of why monotheism works. Just to finish up the first half of it again. So what happens is, of course, in 586 BC, the Babylonians destroy on their way to, you know, just swallowing up, you know, the entirety of the Mediterranean. The Babylonians destroy Israel. But again, according to the theological rules that everyone accepts, it's not Nebuchadnezzar who destroys, you know, the the kings of Israel. It's Marduk who destroys Yahweh. And so, by all the rules that the Jews themselves accept, that's it for Yahweh. Yahweh is dead, their God is gone, their religion is over, and now they have been scattered into exile in the Babylonian Empire. Ouch. But then something happens, something unprecedented, an idea that literally no one had ever thought of before happens in the midst of this exile. And that is that among a small group of Jews living in exile, everyone else, most everyone else just accepted the new reality. They took Babylonian names, they began reading Babylonian scriptures, they began worshiping Babylonian gods, because that's it, Yahweh's done. Yet a tiny group in this exile comes up with this radical new idea. Maybe Marduk did not kill Yahweh. Maybe there is no Marduk. Maybe the only God that exists is Yahweh. And the reason that all of this has happened to us is because Yahweh is punishing us for believing in Marduk in the first place. And that idea, that little germ of an idea, becomes what we now know as monotheism. And interestingly enough, It just sort of accepts all the contradictions. All the reasons why people couldn't accept monotheism beforehand are just sort of brushed away because of this existential crisis. It's very simple. Either my God is dead and my identity no longer exists, or here's a crazy idea. My God is the only God, (laughs) and all of this is just his will. And despite the fact that that seems like such a you know, it seems very comfortable and obvious, I think, in our modern way of thinking. 2,500 years on, yeah. It was unprecedented. Right, right. Yeah, it was but, unprecedented it, but it also time. wasn't, now, it, again, fits and starts. I mean, by the time Christianity comes around, then Christianity very early on gets into a big fight about the nature, whether it's a sort of dualistic or tri- trinity-based approach to monotheism. And that's where political morphism oh, comes. Oh, here we go. I knew you because were going to come back thing, to it. Yes. And it's one thing, look, it's one thing to have this tiny, insignificant Semitic tribe that, you know, none of these empires really care about start to develop this idea of a sole singular God, because who cares? Oh, but will they come to care later on? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yes. It's something else entirely when that tiny, insignificant tribe gives birth to a sect that suddenly becomes the largest religion in the world, the religion of the Roman Empire, no less. And that's Christianity. And Christianity comes up with this problem. Christianity is a Greco-Roman religion. It's not a Jewish religion. It's a Greco-Roman religion. It's steeped in Greco-Roman theology and philosophy. And the Greco-Roman religion doesn't have a concept of monotheism. It's very comfortable with polytheism. And so, Suddenly, you have this problem where you have kind of this Jewish foundation in this Greco religion, and now you have to come up with an idea. Well, is there only one God? I mean, really? Does there only have to be one God? I mean, we'll accept the incarnation. Okay, fine. Jesus was God. But so is Caesar. You know, there are lots of gods, right? And so what you have now is a 300-year battle within Christianity amongst those who say, no, 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 we have to stay true to this one Jewish idea, which is that there is only one God, while trying to figure out how Jesus can also be God. And, oh yeah, there's also the Holy Spirit, but we'll deal with that later. And this other group of Christians who were making the argument, hold it, why are we so married to this one God thing? Why can't Jesus be one God? And then Yahweh will be a second God altogether. And maybe there's even a third God called the Demiurge and all these other gods. What ultimately, the reason that monotheism wins at that point has far less to do with theology and far more to do with political morphism, which means this phenomenon in which we 
create the heavens as a mirror of the earth. In order to justify our form of governance on earth? Per, well, it's more like a dialectic, right? It's that mm. it is partly a, a form of justification, but it is, again, back to this humanizing impulse in the same way that we give God our personalities, we give heaven our bureaucracy. Mm, so and it's sort so of convenient from a governance have, perspective, and it also uh, incidentally works psychologically and emotionally and spiritually. Precisely. So you have one bishop, you have one emperor, so you can only have one God. And so that becomes the foundation uh, theology of Christianity, despite the fact that it immediately leads to these unfixable contradictions, as in, wait, how could there be God if Jesus is also God? Uh, you know, like, yeah. that doesn't make any sense. I mean, like, I, you, can, I, yeah. you can do all kinds of doctrinal gymnastics to try to come up with some way to make that make sense out of that, but fundamentally, it makes no sense. But some would say the church did a lot of doctrinal exactly. dynamics. Uh, you know, they, they've been doing dynamics. that for uh, a fair uh, amount of the last uh, <laughs> few thousand years, yeah. And so that's where you get the situation where now monotheism is essentially the the accepted premise, even for people who don't believe in God, even for mm -hmm. people who reject the very concept of God, if you ask them what God is, they speak about God in a singular way. The God they reject is only yeah. one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we have to start wrapping up, but we have a last question that combines a lot of elements, so we're going to try to see if we can make sense of this question. Your own journey is part of this book. I mean, you, you talk about it in the beginning and the end, you sort of frame it, and you end up with Sufism, which is interesting, but you explain that your journey ends because in Sufism you sought a, quote, a singular, eternal, and indivisible God. And I think that this leads to another, you know, sort of related insight that you have about the meaning of God in general and in your life. And you quote Spinoza, which is also interesting, to describe God as a single undifferentiated reality, or as you, again, quoting you, all is one and one is all. But yeah. I want to understand, if this is the actual truth of God for human experience, okay, if this is how you see the most, un, you know, the deepest understanding of mm -hmm. God, what does that mean for the distinction that, as you know, Mircea Eliade so famously put it, the sacred and the profane, mm -hmm. which to my mind is the most deeply rooted human experience, fundamental to all human beings. We all have a distinction anchored deep inside our soul between what is sacred and what is profane. And if everything is a single undifferentiated reality of God, how do we reconcile those two? What does God even mean if we remove it from yeah, the whole, in, if, in if other we, words, that distinction? If, yeah. if God is everything, it's also nothing, isn't it? There you go. Gilad always says things faster than me. <laughs> yes. If God is everything, it's also nothing. But it's also important to understand that the distinction between sacred and profane, though you can spell it out in ritualistic and ceremonial functions that we can actually observe and, you know, define and interpret, is in the pantheistic worldview, nothing more than a moral distinction. There are those things that are good actions and those things that are not good actions. But insofar as a substantive matter, there is no difference between that which is good and that which is evil. These are not cosmic phenomena, in other words, for a pantheist like myself. All things are God and God is all things. Because if God is singular and indivisible, then there can be no distinction between creator and creation. Anything that exists, exists only insofar as it shares in the existence of God. And I think for a lot of people, whether they're religious or not, that's a very difficult concept to accept, not just because it violates this cognitive impulse to humanize the divine and therefore imagine a God who acts just like you do, because then it's easier to commune with that God. But also, I think because for a lot of people, they think, well, then what about morality? How am I supposed to do good and not do bad if I'm not getting some reward or punishment for it? How am I supposed to know the distinction between sacred and profane and avoid one and follow the other if God isn't the one who is sort of this person giving me that information. How am I supposed to know the difference between something and nothing if, you know, God is both of those things? And those are complex spiritual questions that each individual needs to answer for him or herself. But I'll tell you how I answer it as a person of faith and as a pantheist. My pantheism, of course, came through Sufism, but pantheism exists in all religious traditions, including Judaism. But for me as a pantheist, 
because I think of all people and all things as God, it transforms the way that I understand the very idea of, say, worship. Because worship isn't a thing that I do in a space at a specific time. Worship is my everyday experience walking through life because all things are God. The way that I function with other individuals isn't about an I and thou experience, to quote Martin Buber, I because there like is no experience. I and thou. Yeah, <laughs> because there is no I and thou. My experience of another individual is my experience of God. So I treat that person as though I am experiencing God. So it, it keeps me from devaluing that person. Same thing with nature. Okay, but I think if that's God kind of what Martin things, Buber— That's I, how I think about— I have to say I think that's what Martin Buber had in mind in a lot of ways. So, I mean, we could have a long a double interview about Martin oh, Buber. Oh, yeah. Let's but have I a think Buber a lot fight. Is, let's you have know, a Buber fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Buber fight. Yeah, I'm afraid that we'll, we'll have to leave it for another podcast. Uh, we've Buber run fight. out of time. That's uh, Reza Aslan. Discussing his uh, uh, new book, God, A Human History. Reza, thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs> My pleasure, guys. Anytime. And uh, many or most of you uh, who listen to us, uh, please uh, go to Apple Podcasts app and we have a special request for you. Uh, please consider writing us a review. Just launch the app, select our podcast in the library section, scroll down to ratings and review and press write a review. But then you actually have to write one. And then write one. And also uh, a big thanks to Gizim Ozdemir, our sound engineer, to Itai Shalem, our producer, and to the Van Leer Institute for the generous support. Also many thanks to Peter Frey and Carrie Shapiro and the Rome Foundation for the generous contribution. You can support us by going to our website. It's tlv1.fm slash podcasts slash a Tel Aviv Review Show. And subscribe on our Patreon campaign. We've got gifts for you and other perks for patrons only. Check out our archive with over 400 interviews to keep you busy and hopefully annoyed. Like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast Ideas from Israel. And follow me and Dahlia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, and goodbye.